started. Thank you for spending your lunchtime with the Staten Island Museum. I'm Riley Ettergenoso, Public Programs Manager. And today's Lunch and Learn is around a broadside found in the archives of the Staten Island Museum. Lunch and Learn is a series that connects to our online exhibit, 140 Objects, celebrating the museum's 140th anniversary. And um, I encourage you to visit it uh, after this presentation. Um, I know I'm biased, it's great. Um, so, this, so this broadside, um, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show per was performed at Aristina, an amusement venue in the modern day neighborhood of Mariners Harbor. So today we have Jeremy and Johnson here to tell us more about that. Um, Mr. Johnson is the Hal and Naoma Tate Endowed Chair of Western History, the Goppert Curator of the Buffalo Bill Museum, and the Managing Editor of the Papers of William F. Cody. So without further ado, welcome Mr. Jeremy Johnson. Thank you, Riley, and thanks to all of you for joining us today over your lunch hour. Um, I was going to say good morning, but I realize it's good afternoon there. So we're just at 10 o'clock here in Cody, Wyoming. But anyway, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about the life and legacy of Buffalo Bill and his connection to Staten Island. Oh, I'll pull up my PowerPoint here. All right, so today we're going to talk about Buffalo Bill and the dramatization of the American, of American Western history. Um, basically, I want to hit on three points today. The first one is looking at Buffalo Bill Cody as a unique performer. Um, his combination of authenticity and drama has not been equaled before or since. And then I wanna talk about the legacy of Buffalo Bill's Wild West and how it shaped our current perceptions of westward expansion and gave us a lot of those iconic images we connect with the American frontier. And then lastly, I just wanna to touch upon, you know, Buffalo Bill is an example of how entertainment influences how we see history, how we view the past. And in my opinion, entertainment probably is one of the most powerful forces out there in shaping, especially here in America, how we view our own history. So, uh, let's see if I can click here, there we go. So a little disclaimer, um, there may be a little bias here, uh, I'll let you decide, but uh, I am from Cody, Wyoming. This has basically been my home turf for quite a while. My family settled here in the 1890s. Uh, I had one great grandfather who worked for both Theodore Roosevelt as a hunting guide in Colorado and then came up to the Bighorn Basin here in Wyoming and worked for Buffalo Bill Cody. So this is the metropolis of Cody, Wyoming. It was founded in 1896. Uh, 1910, it had a population of 1,132, and it has now skyrocketed to 9,764. So, and if you count in the surrounding people living in the rural areas around Cody, um, you can probably double that to about 20,000. So, at, at, what is the population of Staten Island now? I do not know. Over half a million. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Half a million. It's about a half a million. Yeah. Half a million. Okay. And uh, so the entire state of Wyoming is 510,000 people. So um, basically, our entire, your entire population figure is scattered across here in Wyoming. But anyway, it's really quite amazing in 1917, and this really demonstrates the, the legacy of Buffalo Bill Cody. When he passed away, the local community formed the Buffalo Bill Memorial Association, and they wanted to do something to create a monument for Buffalo Bill. And uh, they tried to build a, a statue, but this was during World War I, and it kind of stalled, and it didn't get going again until the 1920s. But anyway, through the Buffalo Bill Memorial Association, not only did we erect a statue that's titled The Scout, which was sculpted by Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, 
I think you New Yorkers would know those, those family names. But anyway, we've also constructed a center that's over 300,000 square feet with five different museums, including the Whitney Museum of Western Art, um, which was our second museum after the Buffalo Bill Museum, a research library and archives, the papers of William F. Cody, which I oversee. So we bring in about 180,000 annual visitors, 80 full-time staff, 4,000 members, over 100,000 objects, over 500,000 historical photos, 30,000 books related to the history of the American West, and 2,000 linear feet of documents and records. Not bad for small town Wyoming. And as I was talking to Riley, a lot of this was due to our connections to places like Staten Island, to the Vanderbilt, the Whitney family. Um, one of our trustees said uh, the Buffalo Bill Center of the West is a perfect example of what Westerners can do by using Easterners money. So, and I do hope uh, if you haven't been out here, I encourage you to visit, probably in the summer. Uh, so right now I'm looking at uh, snow covered mountains. But anyway, um, a lot of people just assume Buffalo Bill was an actor. Um, and he was. Buffalo Bill started performing on stage in 1872. What made him unique is he played himself. And one of these surreal experiences made that, transformed him from a Western plainsman or a Western frontiersman into an actor. He was in uh, Chicago and he was attending a play and up on the stage was an actor pretending to be Buffalo Bill Cody. The audience realized the real Buffalo Bill was in the audience, was in the stands and they asked him to stand up and be recognized and the audience just loved it. You know, here's the real Buffalo Bill. They managed to get him up on stage. He mumbled a few words, uh, was very embarrassed, got back to his seat and collapsed. But uh, the manager, and a few uh, Buffalo Bill's friends, and especially his uh, first dime novelist, Ned Buttline, started to see dollar signs. They thought, this is a good way to make money. We can get him to the East, on the Eastern Theater, then uh, he's gonna make a lot of money. He's gonna be able to basically recreate his own exploits, his own adventures. So he, it was an unusual experience. Um, that he went through in becoming an actor. And basically he never did perform anybody else but himself. And he was an authentic Westerner. Uh, this was an individual that had lived in the American West and had experienced a, a tremendous amount of the violence that was taking place out here. Um, it, you know, his life began in peaceful Iowa. He grew up in near LeClaire, Iowa, close to the Mississippi River. Uh, he described his childhood as being very idyllic, almost like Tom Sawyer's and Huckleberry Finn's. In fact, uh, some of the illustrations used in the first autobiography he published, they ripped off from Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer. So uh, anyway, idyllic life in Iowa until his older brother Samuel was killed in a horse accident, which you see there on the, on the right. The horse reared up, killed him. And the family decided to relocate. And they chose of all places, Kansas. At the worst possible time, you would wanna live in Kansas. This was the 1850s and the West was falling apart over the issue of the expansion of slavery. So you had people moving into Kansas that wanted to make it a free state to where there would be no slavery allowed. But you also had people from Missouri wanting to expand slavery into Kansas and make it a slave state. And this is basically the precursor of the Civil War. You had Kansas Jayhawkers raiding into Missouri, you know, basically stealing slaves, stealing property. You had Missourians coming in, raiding places like Lawrence, Kansas. Very violent time period. Okay, and this is where we start to see the emergence of people like Wild Bill Hickok who was a good friend of Buffalo Bill Cody and became renowned as probably, you know, the first American gunslinger. Cody's own family got heavily involved in this. His dad was asked to share his views on slavery. 
And his dad, Isaac, stood up on a soapbox and said, I am against Kansas becoming a slave state. One of the ruffians jumped up there, stabbed him. Okay, they were able to get Isaac out of there. They nursed him back to health, but he never did quite recover. And the rest of his life, and he only had a few years left, were basically spent in hiding. And the Cody family would frequently have these people coming into their house, trying to find his father, uh, stealing, in one case, Buffalo Bill's horse, and any other property they could get in there. So this is extremely violent time period in American history. And Cody was right in the middle of this. And violence uh, shaped him as a young man. Um, in fact, uh, in school, we talk about school violence being a problem now, but in school, Cody got into a fight with a bully and Cody retaliated by stabbing the young bully. And he had to flee, left school. A teamster grabbed him and said, uh, we need to get you out of here because this boy's family will come back and probably take it out on you. So Buffalo Bill became a, a kid working for the freight trains that were crossing the American Plains going to places like Denver. You know, in the 1850s, you start to see the gold rushes, the gold strikes, silver strikes in the Rocky Mountains. And so populations are beginning to spring up here and goods are being hauled back and forth. It's also at this time, Buffalo Bill claims he rode for the Pony Express. Uh, we've never been able to prove or disprove this, but uh, we do know, um, you know, he probably did serve uh, some, some very uh, daunting jobs, um, encountered all sorts of uh, experiences that he later recalled in his autobiography. One of his employers was Alfred Slade, who was renowned for getting into a fight with somebody. And um, after he himself had been shot by his opponent, he recovered, came back, shot his enemy and sliced his ears off and kept those as a watch bob as a souvenir. So this is the type of world Buffalo Bill's growing up in. I know all these stories of gang violence and violence in the schools, it seems like an urban issue, but uh, Kansas 1850s was a pretty rough place. So Buffalo Bill's father passed away and that made Buffalo Bill the man of the house. Uh, he had a number of sisters, a younger brother that he needed to care for. His mother was still alive trying to make ends meet. And since he had been out in the West kind of fleeing from this bully's family, Again, he did all sorts of jobs out there working for the Teamsters coming through on the plains. And we're not exactly sure how many of these adventures are true, how many of these maybe Cody took from other people, taking stories that were told around the campfire, or were made up by the person who published his autobiography. But according to this, we know he supposedly fought uh, horse thieves, killed two of them trying to escape. He killed his first... Indian at the age of 12, this Lakota was sneaking up on them and was going to shoot at somebody and Cody at 12 years old shot the Indian before he could do any damage. He supposedly got involved in the Mormon war when the US Army was sent out to try and control the Mormon population in Utah and arrested a notorious horse thief by the name of Bevins who tried to escape and uh, they only caught him when he barefoot because they took his shoes off. They didn't want him running away at night, but uh, barefoot, this poor guy ran through some prickly pear cactus and that's how they caught him. So anyway, um, all these stories were part of Cody's repertoire. Uh, these were the types of things he was going to recreate on stage. So he picked up the name Buffalo Bill um, after he had tried to invest in the West. And there's something interesting about Buffalo Bill Cody is he never really made any fortune, uh, any financial windfall in the American West. Uh, he tried to found a town which was known as Rome, Kansas, but he refused to deal with the railroad company. And the railroad tracks bypassed his town and all of the businesses in Cody's town moved to Hayes City. But the railroad, the Kansas Pacific, Union, Kansas Pacific Railroad, needed buffalo meat to feed the workers that were building across the plains of Kansas. And Buffalo Bill began working for one of the meat suppliers, the Goddard Brothers. 
and was renowned for his buffalo hunting style where he would basically circle the herd and drop them in a close area. So you basically could bring in the, the men who would butcher the meat for the workers and everything was gathered together. Two different versions of how I became Buffalo Bill. First one is there was another Buffalo Bill in the West and he challenged Buffalo Bill to a shoot off a hunting contest and Buffalo Bill Cody won and got the title. The other version is that the railroad workers became so sick of eating buffalo meat, they named him Buffalo Bill. So we're not sure, but this is how he picked up that name, that moniker Buffalo Bill. Uh, since he was familiar with the, the Western area, uh, he also became a scout, a civilian scout for the military. Um, this was after he fought in the Civil War. And you have to keep in mind that the Civil War I know a lot of us think that just impacted the East, but it had a tremendous impact on the West because what happened is you shifted federal troops from these Western posts to fight in the Civil War in the East. And that left Westerners, Western volunteers. And it was the Western volunteers that basically believed the federal government was coddling the Plains Indians. And this is, the group that really did believe in that adage, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. This is when we see things like the Sand Creek Massacre, just this horrible slaughter of Cheyenne men, women, and children in Colorado. Uh, you know, just indescribable massacre. And so by the time the Civil War is over, the Plains are in just complete disarray. You have a lot of the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Lakota that basically are not wanting to negotiate with these people anymore, okay? So the army has to come in and basically try to restore peace to the plains after the Civil War. And this is where Buffalo Bill comes in as a scout. Um, in 1869, he participated at the Battle of Summit Springs, which you see on the left here. Uh, this is where he killed a Cheyenne dog soldier by the name of Chief Tallbull. And uh, this made him a celebrity. Uh, basically, in Tallbull's village, there were two white female captives that the Cheyenne dog soldiers had taken in. The army managed to save one of the women. Uh, one was killed by Tallbull's wife. But anyway, this was one of those sensational stories that people were looking for to kind of find some way to justify what was going here on going on in the plains and these conflicts with the Plains Indians. And so uh, a dime novelist by the name of Ned Buntline came in and uh, said, I'm going to make you a star and wrote the first Buffalo Bill dime novel. And the US Army also realized this is a great opportunity for us because not only do we have a dime novel hero who's a scout, we could use him to entertain all these wealthy industrialists from the cities and journalists from the cities who wanna come out and hunt buffalo on the plains. And so James Gordon Bennett Jr. was one of the first to come out and go on a hunting expedition with Buffalo Bill. And of course, these New York newspapers just love to detail the exploits of William F. Cody. This is what led him to become that actor. So when he stood up in Chicago and was recognized, people knew him as a dime novel hero. They knew it entertained all these wealthy New Yorkers on these hunting trips. And this is where it gets kind of unusual because Buffalo Bill, he was an actor. He continued on as an actor, but in 1876, after the Battle of the Little Bighorn, after Custer's last stand, he came back to the plains as a scout. The story is, is that he forgot to bring his regular scouting costume and he brought a stage costume. And he looked like a vaquero. He had this bright red shirt, this fancy, hat, <clears throat> these vaquero pants that make John Travolta's style in uh, Saturday Night Light Fever look normal, had all sorts of silver piping on them, bell bottoms. <clears throat> and he comes out and at the Battle of Warbonnet Creek, as you see here on the right side of the slide, 
<clears throat> gets into this conflict with Chief Yellowhair, who they mistranslate his name as Yellow Ham. But anyway, <clears throat> he takes what is known as the first scout for Custer. And these soldiers from the 5th Cavalry are watching this actor basically perform this very dramatic real act out on the plains. And so what does Buffalo Bill do? He takes the scout and he performs in New York City. He reenacts this. So when you're in the audience, you're kind of, you're having a hard time sorting out what's, what's fact, what's fiction here, what's being dramatized, what's authentic, because you're watching a person perform something that he had done out on the plains. The only thing I can use to compare to this in our modern world is Audie Murphy. So Audie Murphy was the most decorated soldier in World War II. He came back, became a movie star, performed as himself, um, but didn't quite reach the level of success that Buffalo Bill did as an entertainer. Uh, just imagine. So if you want to kind of think about what Buffalo Bill just uh, accomplished, just imagine if John Wayne had actually fought at Iwo Jima in World War I and then came back and made the film The Sands of Iwo Jima. That's pretty much what you have going on here. So a tremendous success. You know, he was renowned as a celebrity guy, dime novel hero, theatrical star. In 1883, he launches Buffalo Bill's Wild West, which basically took his reenactments and put them on a grander scale. He felt limited by the stage. He couldn't really recreate the, the scale and scope of what had happened here in the West. And this made him an international celebrity. So I'm gonna pause and just uh, pose a question. Who is the greatest showman? So a couple of years ago, there was a, a movie, a musical, The Greatest Showman, which really highlighted the career of P.T. Barnum. And I love this image here. If you look on the, on the left, that is an image of Buffalo Bill's office at the Irma Hotel here in Cody, Wyoming. And up here on the wall, is a portrait of P.T. Barnum. So who is the greatest showman? Well, during Buffalo Bill's time, even before and after, there were over 116 different Wild West shows that we know of, over 116 that we know of. Now, if I pose the question, you know, name a Wild West show, um, how many of you would be able to come up with a, another Wild West show besides Buffalo Bill's Wild West? <laughs> I've seen shaking heads. Sometimes Pawnee Bill gets thrown out, thanks to Ethel Merman and Andy Get Your Gun. Again, the power of entertainment and shaping our perceptions of history. But all of these shows are pretty much forgotten except Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Okay. And again, the reason for that, in my opinion, is Buffalo Bill was able to capture this combination of authenticity and drama that no other show was able to, to achieve. And on top of that, Buffalo Bill was very good at giving people what they wanted to see. And this is where Staten Island comes in. Aristina, Mariner's Harbor, was the site. So basically at one time in the 1880s, Staten Island was the equivalent of Hollywood today. Okay, Staten Island was the center of one of the most powerful forms of American entertainment. Okay, and Buffalo Bill comes in there in June 1886. Um, we're not exactly sure of what his collaboration was with, with Erastus Wyman, um, but again, I think Erastus being a real estate developer and um, a newspaper journalist appealed to Buffalo Bill who was looking at ways to invest money and also uh, like to keep the press happy. But anyway, they would come here and they would perform in Staten Island. And this is a critical juncture in Buffalo Bill's career, his acting career, because after they perform there at Staten Island, they take the show overseas. They go to London. 
So like Barnum, like P.T. Barnum, who went and performed before Queen Victoria, Buffalo Bill does the exact same thing and then brings it back to Staten Island. So they were there six weeks beginning in May. And then after their tour concluded, they went to Philadelphia, then Baltimore, and then on to Washington, D.C. Um, early in the stage of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, they'd like to choose one area and have basically people come to them. And this is the broadside that Riley mentioned, which uh, details some of the acts you would have seen in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And these acts are so ingrained in the American culture that you see them even today, okay? But anyway, uh, this is Buffalo Bill before Queen Victoria. Um, you can see that in the stand, they were performing before 20,000 people. Just gives you the, an idea of the scope of the show. Not only did he bring over hundreds of performers, reenactors, but he also brought a small herd of elk and a small herd of bison with them, in addition to all the horses, the stagecoach and everything. This was a, a grand spectacle. And uh, according to Cody in the Wild West, this was the first time a British monarch saluted the American flag. My colleagues from Scotland, however, they've kind of told me that Queen Victoria was renowned for falling asleep, dozing off. And so they said, well, maybe she just kind of dozed off and someone fired a, a pistol and she raised her head. You know, they well, it's close enough, it's a salute. So when he comes back to Staten Island, he is an international success. He has taken Europe by storm. So some of the iconic acts, and I just want you to keep in mind uh, as I'm going through these, some of these images that you may have seen in the television Westerns, the Hollywood Westerns, or if you like to read Western novels, Louis L'Amour, how many times you've seen these played out over and over again? So as I noted, we're not sure if Buffalo Bill rode for the Pony Express, okay? But I can tell you, he made the Pony Express a cultural icon. So the Pony Express only lasted for about a year and a half. It was a failed business, okay? Nightly, Buffalo Bill performed the Pony Express relay. And think about the number of Westerns you've seen where the Pony Express rider is one of the main characters or one of the, uh, the side characters or you see the Pony Express running in the background there. This is a great French poster. You can see uh, he was even introducing the people of France to the Pony Express. A lot of the acts also focused on the Plains Indian Wars. So this is basically his recreation of the Battle of Summit Springs, uh, which greatly exaggerated Cody's role in this conflict. Um, they have him riding into the village to save the female captives, and actually he never did enter the village. When he killed Chief Tallbull, he basically wanted Chief Tallbull's horse, and he tells about this in the autobiography, but he wasn't front and center like this, wasn't leading the charge, as you can see, so a little exaggeration there. And of course, you can also, you've seen this a number of times, the cavalry going through the village uh, not only in past Westerns, but even things like, you know, current movies like Dances with, Wol uh, uh, Dances with Wolves, very common, common depiction of the West. Uh, Custer's Last Stand was another big one as well. So he recreated Custer's Last Stand um, using a lot of Lakota who were actually there fighting against Custer. In fact, Chief Sitting Bull traveled with Buffalo Bill's Wild West for a few months in 1885. Uh, he was not part of the reenactments though. He basically was a distinguished guest of the Wild West. But anyway, let me tell you, the last stand did not really happen like this. But if you watch any Western, they're basically using Cody's version of the last stand. Attack of the Deadwood Stagecoach. This rarely happened in the American West. Okay, very few stagecoaches were ever attacked by Indians. Your chances of being robbed by outlaws were greater than, than being uh, attacked by Indians on the stagecoach. Let's face it, people who ran the stagecoaches were entrepreneurs. If there was an Indian uprising, they weren't about to risk losing 
their assets by sending stagecoaches into that area. They rerouted the, the route or they canceled their services until things were controlled. But again, this is performed on a nightly basis in Buffalo Bills Wild West. And again, thinking back at those Western films, this is a common trope. How many of you grew up playing Cowboys versus Indians? Okay, I see a few hands. So yeah, Cowboys versus Indians. Cowboys came into the American West really at the tail end of the Plains Indian Wars. Uh, it was very, very rare to see any kind of conflict, violent conflict between Indians and Cowboys. Okay, basically the Cowboys were coming in after many of the Plains Indians were confined on reservations. But this is kind of an interesting switch through Buffalo Bills Wild West because when the Lakota performers would attack the stagecoach, Buffalo Bill would ride in not with the cavalry, he'd ride in with a group of cowboys and they would save the day. And that became so ingrained in the American mind that we see it playing out over and over again. We would think that was just a common job description for every cowboy is you had to fight Indians every now and then. The other thing that's really quite amazing is when he launched Buffalo Bills Wild West in 1883, cowboys were not seen as being very heroic. Uh, I like to describe them as hell's angels on horseback, okay? These are not the type of people you wanted your kids to admire. These were the type of people that rode into town after a trail drive or after being out on the plains for months and they'd shoot the town up. They get drunk, they cause all sorts of problems. Buffalo Bill, however, begins to work with others. You know, this is at the same time Theodore Roosevelt, Frederick Remington are coming up with some positive portrayals of cowboys as well as Owen Wister who writes the first successful Western novel, The Virginian. But Buffalo Bill probably did more than those three in changing the cowboy from a Hells Angels on horseback, a villain into a hero. In fact, if you've seen the movie Tombstone, and you know how the cowboys are depicted in the movie Tombstone, that's how most people saw cowboys back in the 1880s. Even the president of the United States, Chester A. Arthur, was afraid of cowboys. When he came out to visit Yellowstone National Park in 1883, the first president of the United States to do so, they weren't afraid about him being attacked by Indians. They weren't afraid about him being attacked by grizzly bears. They were afraid cowboys would kidnap the president of the United States, hold him hostage until the country played, paid a, a ransom to the cowboys. In fact, uh, because of the problems in Tombstone and New Mexico with Billy the Kid, as you can see here in this slide, President Chester A. Arthur in his first annual message to Congress actually requested their help in trying to control the rough and wild cowboy element in the Southwest. So these are not good guys, but through Buffalo Bill's Wild West, they become the common working class hero here in the United States. I also want to point out that the show was very diverse. Um, the Carols were also a strong part of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, and they were depicted as being skilled ropers, skilled riders. Um, in fact, it was one of the Vaquero performers who inspired a young Will Rogers to go on and become a trick roper and become an entertainer. So but anyway, um, very positive depiction of the Vaqueros and their contribution to the ranching history of the West. Women, Buffalo Bill also included a lot of female performers, the most famous being Annie Oakley, you can see pictured there on the right, but also Lillian Smith, who was there in the center, who was also a sharpshooter. And in fact, Buffalo Bill in the 1880s came out publicly to support the women's suffrage movement. He was quite an advocate for recognizing women's rights to vote. Um, I think also the show really knocked out one of the primary arguments for the anti-suffrage movement. A lot of people who thought if women got the right to vote, they would become too masculine. They would become kind of like those Calamity Jane types that we have out in the American West. And Buffalo Bill's Wild West said, no, 
Women can perform what is usually deemed as a masculine sport, such as shooting, okay? and they certainly can cast their votes and retain their female qualities. So I think that did a lot to kind of counter that anti-suffrage article uh, argument. And just by the way, you all know who was the first territory and the first state to recognize women voting rights? Wyoming. <laughs> here in Gabby Wyoming. Put that in the chat. <laughs> yeah, here in Wyoming. So um, this is where things get a little complicated because Buffalo Bill certainly shaped a lot of those popular images of the American West. And of course, um, that basically meant demonizing the Lakota and other Plains Indians. Okay? They were always seen as the villains. Okay? And Buffalo Bill and the Cowboys were the good guys who came in and saved the day. Uh, Buffalo Bill never did recreate things like the Sand Creek Massacre, never really referred to it in any, uh, any of his shows. So it was all a very one-sided depiction of history. And again, it, it really points out that the victors write the history. But his relationship with the Lakota was pretty complex. And also the role of these Lakota performers is, is you got to keep in you know, the context of the times in mind when you consider this. The Lakota performers were treated as equals. They were paid a fair wage in cases where there were conflicts between cowboys and Lakota behind the scenes, such as who got the best horses, Buffalo Bill often sided with the Lakota. <clears throat> One of Buffalo Bill's best friends was this guy on the, on the left, Chief Iron Tail. Iron Tail was also considered one of the models for the, the Buffalo Nickel, for the profile of the Plains Indian on the Buffalo Nickel. <clears throat> but anyway, many Lakota performers saw this as a great way to preserve their culture. You know, this was at a time in the 1880s when they're confined on a reservation and basically they're being given the, you know, really not a choice, but they're being told, you will speak English, you will give up your religious beliefs, you will become farmers, okay, and you basically are going to become Americans, you are going to assimilate. And of course, a lot of times that meant sending your children to the boarding schools, where they were giving a uh, basically an English style education. Performers said, okay, we can do that or we can travel with Buffalo Bill's Wild West and we can recreate what life was like in our cultural heyday. You know, we can continue wearing our traditional clothing. We can travel the world. We can get money. We can get a salary, which was scarce, almost impossible on the reservation at this point in time, okay? And many of the Lakota performers, their, their ancestor or their descendants, their descendants today speak very highly of their experiences in Buffalo Bill's Wild West and also speak very highly of Buffalo Bill. So we know he had a very good working relationship with this, these people. Um, there was a mutual respect there. And I think that's something that, that kind of gets lost in a lot of the, the depictions that he was putting forward. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, Buffalo Bill was prone, as his management team were as well, to give people what they wanted to see. And so people of the East wanted to see things like Custer's Last Stand, the first scout for Custer Battle of Summit Springs. But it's interesting when he takes it overseas and he goes through Germany, there in Germany, there was a novel called Binitou about an Apache chief that united all the, tried to unite all the tribes of the plains against white expansion. And Vinitu was a cultural hero. So the Germans start watching these reenactments of Indians being defeated and they say, no, we don't wanna see this. So Buffalo Bill says, yeah, you know, we need to change up the act. This isn't going to work. So they stopped those recreations of the Indian wars in Germany and instead focused on opening up the Indian encampment to where German people could come in and see what it was like living in a Plains Indian camp. Uh, they could interact with not only the Lakota warriors, but also many of them traveled with their, their wives, their children as well. So you could interact with families and you could see what they were doing. And to this day, 
Germany is probably by far the number one fan when it comes to Plains Indian culture. But anyway, the last years of Buffalo Bill were not all that kind. Um, the show went bankrupt in 1913, uh, came to an end. He started performing for Sells Floto Circus, basically as an attraction. He would ride into the arena, wave at the crowd, and that was it. Uh, he did get involved with the Miller Brothers for a military preparedness show. Um, but he realized, uh, you know, Westward Frontier was coming to an end and new frontiers were coming out. So, for example, this image here on the, on the left is Cody shaking hands with a pilot who just demonstrated the, you know, the, the art of flying. And Cody was so impressed with him, he fished out this gold nugget that he had carried with him since his days of working as a teamster going to the Colorado gold fields and gave it to this, this pilot, recognizing that these were the new frontier heroes. He also recognized that uh, new technologies would tell old stories. He did get involved in film. In fact, he tried to film and publicize a, a long series called The Indian Wars where they filmed reenactments of some of the major military engagements he was involved in. And they also filmed at Wounded Knee. They filmed the massacre at Wounded Knee. Uh, this is when I think the Lakota started realizing, coming to terms with what had happened through the Wild West and realizing this is how people see this horrible massacre as a battle. And after the filming, the Lakota began taking actions to memorialize what happened at that point and do so from their perspective. They begin to quite, they begin to understand how powerful entertainment really was in shaping people's perceptions of what had happened here. And then after his death, popular culture made and broke Buffalo Bill as a cultural hero. Um, throughout the, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and even into the 50s, Buffalo Bill was a hero. Okay, many of the films you witness, you know, such as Joe McRae's Buffalo Bill, Charlton Heston as Buffalo Bill, and the Pony Express depicted Buffalo Bill as a hero. But in the United States, things began to change in the 1960s and 70s with the Civil Rights Movement and the Indian Civil Rights Movement. Okay, not only uh, were African Americans and American Indians demanding their political and civil rights, they were demanding that their place in history be recognized. And what we see in popular culture is Buffalo Bill now becomes the anti-hero. They switch hats. So now Buffalo Bill is wearing the black hat. And Paul Newman in 1976 stars as Buffalo Bill in Robert Altman's film, Buffalo Bill and the Indians which basically takes to task this idea that Cody had um, basically uh, abused the show Indians that were with him uh, to simply make a buck um, and didn't really care for their, their welfare. Um, really, again, Buffalo Bill comes across here as just kind of this, this greedy, inept person who had no experiences in the American West whatsoever. And this is where I want you to think about how entertainment shapes our view of the past. Um, for me, this was really drilled home when I was studying in Scotland, because I was over there about the time Braveheart came out. And so all of us Americans had the Mel Gibson version of history on our mind. And we go to these battlefields in Scotland and our Scottish guides would give us an overview of the history. And without fail, the Americans would always ask, well, did the good guys win or did the bad guys win? And our Scottish host looked at us like we were all crazy. And they said, you know, it depends on what you were fighting for at that time. You know, be it if you supported the crown or were against the crown, you were Protestant, Catholic, there are a lot of complexities here. And I think in America, we find comfort in using entertainment to kind of dispel what took place here in the West, because let's face it, all of us benefited from what happened here in the American West. From my own perspective, my family is living on lands that were once claimed by the Shoshone and the Crow, okay? To this day, okay, I'm still living on lands that were once the Shoshone and the Crow. 
You're wondering, well, New York City, what connection do we have to the American West? You have to keep in mind that a lot of the resources that were being taken out of here, which required pushing the Plains Indians onto the reservation, benefited New York. So for example, the hide hunters that came in and slaughtered thousands of buffalo, those hides weren't used for lap robes by us Westerners. They were sent back East and made into the leather belts that dro drove the machinery of the Industrial Revolution. The buffalo tongues were served not here, but at Delmonico's in New York, okay? There's a big open pit mine up in Butte, Montana where they extracted a lot of copper. And let me tell you that copper was used to wire places like New York City. Um, William Jennings Bryan, who ran for president as a Democrat and a populist years ago, I think he summed it up nicely. He said, you could burn the cities of America down and they would be able to repair themselves, rebuild themselves with the resources of the farms and the American West. If you took away the resources of the farms and the American West, the cities would basically see weeds growing in their streets. So we all benefited from this. And it's, it's surprising that Buffalo Bill recognized this. What you see on this slide here are the last words Buffalo Bill published. This is from his last autobiography. And he basically said, every one of us here in the United States, every one of us living in America is living on lands and benefiting from lands and resources that were the American Indians to inherit. And we have in ourselves an obligation to make sure their rights are protected. How many are surprised by this quote? Yeah, it doesn't quite fit to that Buffalo Bill persona. And I hope the one thing you take away from this is not just realizing the life and legacy of Buffalo Bill Cody and Buffalo Bill's Wild West, his connections to Staten Island, but how history, even today, is shaped by popular entertainment. We really are uncomfortable with the complexities of the past, and we like to view our history as drama. And in my opinion, that just does not justify you know, an understanding of the relevancy of the past in deciding how and determining how we become who we are today. So, and I'm sorry I went over, Riley, my bad. <laughs> I kept waiting for you to do the uh, cut it off. But anyway, um, I do ask that you please keep the conversation going. So I'll be happy to take any questions and answers now. And if you wanna reach out to me after the presentation, uh, my email is right there. There's also some links to archives that we developed here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West with more information, not just on Buffalo Bill and Buffalo Bill's Wild West, but also the American West in general. Thank you so much. Um, I am also putting these links in the chat. We did have a question pop in um, through the chat during your presentation and had to do with the slide um, when you were talking about Annie Oakley. And the question is who you meant, you mentioned two of the women by name, but there was a woman on the left. That is one of the Perry sisters. And I excuse, uh, please excuse me for not mentioning her because the Perry sisters, they were um, two sisters from Long Island and they decided to leave their family's horse farm and go out west and they joined Buffalo Bills Wild West and they became trick riders. And they were very adept trick riders. Um, one of my favorite objects in the collections here is the saddle from Ethel Perry. And if you look at the back seat of the saddle, you can see where she's dug her cowboy boots heels into the, the seat of the saddle to try and get some traction as she was doing all these you know, equestrian stunts. But uh, these two women were quite popular. One of them did wear a Mary Buffalo Bill's nephew and she ended up living here in Cody, Wyoming and we ended up with her collection. So you can see her, her dress and saddle and some other things here. Thank you. Do we have any other questions in the house? Gabby, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, what, if any, resources exist uh, of correspondence like between 
Buffalo Bill and the Lakota like chiefs or in your collection? Yeah, one of the challenges in researching Buffalo Bill is in some cases you have these really deep pools of resources to draw from. And in other areas, it's pretty, pretty sparse. It's really sparse. Um, Buffalo Bill did not have a private secretary. So we had no one keeping track of outgoing correspondence. And you know, one of the things we're trying to do with the papers of William F. Cody is trying to collect as much of that correspondence that went out and save it and make it available online as we can. Um, but that's challenging. So really the, the only information we have on the Lakota performers is mainly contractual forms. Um, a lot of newspaper coverage, uh, not only here in the United States, but also throughout Europe because the Europeans were fascinated by the Lakota performers who traveled with Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Um, and I'm really excited. Uh, we're working on a possible grant to try and get onto the Pine Ridge Reservation and interview some of the descendants of performers to get some information there. So, um, because it's amazing, we'll get a lot of people that come in through the McCracken Research Library and say, you know, their ancestor worked for Buffalo Bill. And a lot of times we say, sorry, we can't find any information. There's no, no record whatsoever. But when we have Lakota people come in, we oftentimes can find a name of their ancestor and connect them to a program. And you just, you can tell there's a, a pride there that, you know, they traveled the world with Buffalo Bill. Um, and in some of them, I, there's a great story of a guy by the name of Standing Bear. He traveled to Europe with Buffalo Bill and uh, ended up meeting the love of his life, well, um, an Austrian girl and brought her back to Pine Ridge. And the two of them raised a family. And one of their descendants is Arthur Amiot, who is a, a well-recognized artist. Uh, he studied in, in France and he puts together these wonderful collages of his family's experiences, uh, not just with Buffalo Bill's Wild West, but in assimilating on the reservation. So. So yeah, no, we, there's, <laughs> there's a lot more we want on to find out, um, but I'm unfortunately, I think a lot of it's just been lost to time. You know, so for example, people ask about the Pony Express. Uh, there's no business records that we know of that exist on the Pony Express. So we can't go in and find Cody's name on a payroll ledger or anything like that to prove he was there. Thank you. Good luck with that grant too. That sounds awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I know we're looking forward to it because what's also fascinating is a lot of the Lakota performers went out on their own. They traveled with other Wild West shows and some of them actually staged their own Wild West shows uh, such as Black Elk. Uh, Black Elk actually outside the Black Hills set up a, a Plains Indian encampment and would host nightly performances for visitors coming through the Black Hills. Do you have any uh, extensive archives of photos from when they were on Staten Island? Or any photos um, at all? That is, it's tricky because we have so many photos and they were repurposed for, for different things. So we may have one image and it's the exact same depiction of Buffalo Bill or the performers. And it's connected to half a dozen different locations. So it is challenging because, you know, sometimes we can see buildings in the background and we can kind of piece it together. But, uh, but yeah, I've seen images that have been uh, identified in, you know, six different locations. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, we worked on recreating his performances at Ambrose Park uh, with Ball State to create an augmented reality experience. And we really had a hard time piecing together the images of Ambrose Park. Um, we would take a photo of one thing and just really look at the detail in the background to try and connect it to other features there. And so we were able to basically recreate Ambrose Park. There's a digital model of it now. And when you come up to our static diorama, if you take your cell phone and die, uh, download the app, 
it basically your phone becomes a view to the past and you can see what it was like attending Ambrose Park in 1894. Hmm. So yeah, there's just so many photographs of Buffalo Bill, especially of 1870s on. Thank you. You bet. But now I'm going to have to keep looking. So <laughs> yeah. Do we have any more questions in the house? Well, I hope uh, you guys keep following. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Pat Salmon. Thank you. Um, Thanks to all of you. <laughs> and thank you for your questions. And we hope that you continue to follow Jeremy's work. We're very interested um, in continuing to figure out, you know, more about Staten Island's connection. And, um, and yeah, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And... We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Have a good day. Yeah.